You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Here at Event Horizon, we've explored dozens of mysteries within this universe and beyond. Nowadays, the uncertainty has never been this close to home. How do I grow what I have when it disappears faster than ever? We all know how important it is to decipher these mysteries, but, but nobody can come to a conclusion on how. With Masterworks, you're investing in something that's demonstrated performance for generations an asset that's removed from the chaos of most markets. I'm talking about fine art, museum level, multi-million dollar fine art. Just like any other collectible, whether a vintage car, a watch, or a bottle of wine, this art can appreciate in value over time. In fact, even with all the uncertainty and losses in places like the stock market, the average work of art is worth 26% more than this time last year, according to Morgan Stanley. With Masterworks, you can invest in art from household names at a fraction of the cost it would take to buy a whole painting. This isn't some hotshot selling you an overpriced JPEG. I'm talking about Picasso, Basquiat, Banksy. Names so recognisable that six out of seven Masterworks sales have delivered over 20% net returns. That's right, over 20% net returns. You put in 15000 you walk away with $18,000. Masterworks has over 500,000 members, and there's even a wait list. But our subscribers can skip it by clicking on the link in the description below. Thank you. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Stephen Webb. Dr. Webb is the author of numerous popular science books, including Measuring the Universe, the Cosmological Distance Ladder, as well as If the Universe is Teeming with Aliens, Where is Everybody? 75 Solutions to the Fermi Paradox and the Problem of Extraterrestrial Life. Dr. Webb earned his PhD in Theoretical Particle Physics at the University of Manchester. His many interests include 50 sci-fi, football, cosmology and astrobiology. Remember to subscribe to Event Horizon so you never miss an episode. Stephen Webb, welcome back to the program. Thank you for inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure. Now, Stephen, you have a book that has been revised and is uh, <laughs> one of the most fascinating books I've ever, I've ever read. If the Universe is Teeming with Aliens, Where is Everybody? 75 Solutions to the Fermi Paradox and the Problem of Extraterrestrial Life. Now, Fermi Paradox solutions are like rabbits. One day you have 75, the next day you have 104. And... We just keep thinking of more options as far as what could explain the great silence that we seem to see. Everywhere we look, we don't see any evidence of alien civilizations, but we should, as Fermi pointed out. So the Fermi paradox is predicated on the idea that maybe when we look into the cosmos, we really should see evidence of alien life. Do you agree with that? I mean, do you fundamentally agree that when we look, we should see? So, yes, I, I guess the Fermi paradox is this contradiction between perhaps naive expectation that there are lots of advanced civilizations out there, the perhaps premature observation that we see no signs of them, at least none that science has commonly accepted. But to put more flesh on that, um, we know the universe is big, yeah? We know the galaxy is big. It contains lots of stuff. And in particular, it contains many planets. Now, if we assume the Copernican principle, which is a principle that has stood science in good stead for centuries, that there's nothing special about Earth, there's nothing special about us, then presumably life is going to occur on some of those planets. Now, Frank Drake, who, who sadly passed a few weeks ago, came up with a, 
a, a, a means of estimating how many civilizations there might be. It's it's called the Drake equation, but it's not really an equation as such. But it it, it lets you have some ballpark figures to, to play around with, and 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 people typically think of there being perhaps ten thousand advanced extraterrestrial civilizations, maybe more. On the other hand, the universe is old, yeah? And one of the fantastic parts of my career has, has been seeing the, the precision with which cosmologists now know exactly how old the universe is. When I started, we didn't really know within a factor of two. Now we know that the universe is 13 Point eight billion years old, just under. So those extraterrestrial civilizations, which we expect to exist, could have come into existence 10 million years ago, 100 million years ago, maybe billions of years ago before us. And again, if we allow them the Copernican principle, this idea that there's nothing special about us, well, if they generate technology, and it sees that exponential growth that we see in digital, in bioscience, then some of those civilizations should be able to disturb the universe in a way that we would observe. So I, I do find that mismatch, that contradiction between that expectation, which I share that there should be civilizations out there, and the observation, I find that very strange. We should live in a noisy neighborhood, but it is eerily quiet. That's the thing. Eerily quiet. Now, in context, is it based on the Copernican principle? Is it reasonable to assume that we really should see something? In other words, we should see aliens everywhere, which is, I suppose that's what Fermi posited. And should we, is it simply possible is it simply possible that our vision isn't good enough and that we we actually do see alien civilizations, but we don't recognize them? It's possible. I, I think there's a question to be asked about how would we recognize an alien civilization? These would be creatures, if they exist, with whom we share nothing but prebiotic chemistry. So perhaps it is a little bit of a stretch to expect communication to be able to occur. Having said that, there are so many things we can imagine a civilization doing, wanting to do, that even if they, they, they don't try and communicate with us, there should be the possibility of seeing techno signatures for example we're, we're, we're talking about beings that potentially have had hundreds of millions of years of technological advance um to, just to give you a, an idea of the oceans of time we're talking about that there's more time separating tyrannosaurus rex from stegosaurus than separates us from tyrannosaurus these are vast stretches of time and it seems to me that if and it's a big if if technological civilization does get going then it should be able to disturb the universe in a way that we would see as being clearly artificial and and not natural we might not be able necessarily to communicate with them we might be looking in entirely the wrong place. There's even a, a discussion, I guess, to be had about what life itself is. But from everything we know about life as we know it, and, and, and I understand that that is perhaps uh, entirely anthropomorphic, but how can we talk meaningfully about life as we don't know it? Life as we know it, I, I think, given those oceans of time, if they exist, if they develop technology, I think there are so many ways in which we would be able to pick up their presence. Of course, we haven't been looking very long. We haven't been looking with 
or through all of the windows on the universe, perhaps, that we can. And, and maybe a resolution of the paradox is that we've just got to keep looking. We've got to put more money into this as well. This is, for, for my mind, one of the most important questions in science, the role that biology plays in the universe and perhaps the role that intelligence plays in the universe. This is so important that we should be looking with whatever means and, 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 and whatever tools are at our disposal, because it is so important. I think it, uh, it, it, it's, it, I agree entirely with what you said in that it's the most important question in the universe, because somehow, in some way, we represent the universe observing itself. We are what sees the universe. And I think that that's the most fundamental question within science. It often gets downplayed, though. There are a lot of uh, scientists that just don't ask the question. Do you think that there is a bias in science against asking questions about the, for the Fermi paradox? I, I think there has been in the past. I think that the bias is lessening. I think there is increasingly a recognition that this is a question not only that we can ask, but we might be able, with the tools that are coming our way, we might be able to, to start answering it. I, I, I mentioned the age of the universe and, and, and how, when I started my career, we didn't know whether the universe was 20 billion years old, 10 billion years old, 7. Now we know, and we know because of fantastic advances in observational science. We have some incredible, incredible observatories coming our way uh, in the next few years, and they will be able to ask questions and make observations in ways that were just not thought of 10, 15 years ago. We, we can start thinking about characterizing exoplanetary atmospheres. It's not that long ago when I was a student, we didn't know for certain whether other planets existed for sure. So the frustrating thing for me is that I might not be around long enough to see the answer, but I think over the next few decades, we do have uh, as scientists a really good chance of perhaps answering the question, what would be very, very disturbing is if we keep on observing the universe in more and more detail with more and more exquisite instruments and we still find nothing. That would be a bit spooky, a bit disturbing. That's something that I think about a lot. The uh, answer to the Fermi paradox is that we are alone in this gigantic, enormous, possibly even infinite universe. And all of a sudden we, we sit there and we look and we see nothing for centuries. And that sort of makes the Copernican principle an assumption, doesn't it? It, 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 it does. And I, I, I find that actually quite disturbing at, at, at a psychological level. I, um, th we're, we're recording this coming up to, to Halloween and it, it's, it's that time of year, spooky films on, on television. I saw a, a, a movie called The Others uh, recently, starring Nicole Kidman, highly recommend it. And I found it really uh, scary it's all implied menace, it's implied threat, and there's this isolated house, you don't know what's what's going on. And for me, it was the not knowing quite what's going on that I find psychologically quite unsettling. And it's, it, it, it's entirely possible that we will continue to, to observe the universe and not find anything, not quite know for certain whether we're alone or not. I, I think that the answer actually to the Fermi paradox is that we probably are alone, but it's not a solution, a resolution that I, I care for emotionally. Of course, the universe doesn't care what I think or, or what I care, but it, it is the solution that makes most sense to me. But it would be an eerie feeling, wouldn't it, that in all this immensity, it, it, it's us. It's just us rattling around. Arthur C. Clarke once famously said that 
either we are alone in the universe or we are not, and both answers are equally disturbing. I actually find the proposition that we're alone particularly disturbing, even more so than discovering alien life, simply because we become an exception to the Copernican principle. All of a sudden, this planet becomes this magical place where organic chemistry of a certain flavor happens and it happens nowhere else. And that, that disturbs me. <laughs> I, I, I don't like uniqueness in the universe. I like repeatability. So c c can I g give you a, an example of a, a solution, if you like, to the paradox that, that, that came in quite recently? Um, it was published 2020, so it's not in, in, in my book. Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's just an idea. I mean, it, it's, it, it's not necessarily something to be taken for granted, but it gives you an idea of what, one possible reason why we might be alone and why maybe the universe has to be as big as it is in order to contain us. So it's a, a, a piece of work published by a physicist called um, Tominari Tatani. And Tatari says, we don't know how life started, okay? Well, we just don't. We don't know how we got from prebiotic chemistry to life. There's this assumption that the early universe had water and it had this soup of chemicals and there were these large gravitational tides and lots of energy going in with lightning and heat and the rest of it. And you cook this broth for tens of millions of years and somehow you get life and maybe that's the case but what are the exact steps involved we don't know but one possibility is something called the rna world ribonucleic acid world and rna is important because it can store and replicate genetic information like dna and that is one of the the key definitions of life and it can catalyze chemical reactions that we know are necessary for life, at least life as we know it. So it can play this, this double role. So the idea is that somehow you get RNA, and then from RNA, things evolve into more complex things like DNA and so on. Now, RNA is a, a polymer of nucleotides. Think of it as a, a chain of these blocks called nucleotides and you need about 40 maybe 100 of these nucleotides in a chain in a particular order in order to have self-replication now there might be some mechanism that polymerizes nucleotides to create this rna but we don't know what that mechanism would be and as far as we know it's just a stochastic random process, right? You're just adding, or nature is adding one nucleotide to another um, and, and seeing if they fit in just some random process. Now, if it is random, this turns out to be a combinatoric problem. And the chances of RNA just coming into being are astronomic. And, and actually, it's a lot worse than astronomic. Essentially, there's no chance of it happening in our observable universe of, I don't know, 10 to the 22 stars. But Tatari says, our best model of the, the cosmos suggests it came into being from a, a, an inflationary period. So you have this small patch of space time and that expands exponentially. You get exponential inflation. So our observable universe is just a small patch of a much bigger multiverse of very, very many um, other patches, perhaps similar to our own. We, we, we don't know for certain because it's beyond the horizon, but perhaps like ours. And Tatari said that in that multiverse of perhaps 10 to the 100 sun-like stars, you could just from a random chance get this abiogenesis. Now, not to take that too seriously, but it gives you an idea of, of how it could be just a chance event, but it's a chance event that leaves us unique, not only in this case, in our observable universe, but in the multiverse. That is, to my mind, super spooky. Would you characterize 
having having written a book on the solutions to the Fermi paradox, would you characterize the option that we are alone as the most terrifying? Not necessarily. I, I think it's the most psychologically problematic solution, at least for me. But then if, if we go to this analogy of Halloween movies, on the one hand, you have something like the others, which is quite subtle. At the other end, you have these mad axe murderer movies where some madman's going around chopping up teenagers. It doesn't appeal to me. But there are solutions um, where you assume that there are predators out there. Uh, and if you believe in the existence of extraterrestrial civilizations, then one possibility is that either there's predation going on or civilizations keep quiet and we don't see them because they fear that there might be predation going on. So that could be quite a, an unpleasant solution. One of my favorite film franchises of all time, speaking of scary Halloween movies, is Alien. And is it possible that we simply assume too much about alien civilizations and that maybe they are so different from us that we don't really know what to look for? Because you can't exactly see a xenomorph, you know, attacking people on a starship from a distance. You can't really see that. <laughs> so... Is it possible that some, that we are just a very broad species in our abilities and we emit a techno signature as weak as it is, we emit radio and things that can be seen ostensibly at a distance, but could it just simply be that most intelligent life in the universe is in the form of things like the alien? A absolutely, and, and we always have to be on our guard against this anthropomorphizing in general. So, so I, I mentioned the predator interpretation. I mean, it, it goes back to uh, Fred Saberhagen with Berserkers and more recently The Dark Forest of uh, Chichen Lu. But they're, they're predicated on this idea that alien civilizations would have the same motivations as us, that they'd take this first strike approach um, because they assume everyone else will take that first strike approach, you know, seek out new life, new civilizations and kill it. That might be a very, very parochial attitude. And, it, and it, it, it's very difficult, I think, to free our minds of the attitudes that have developed within us. I mean, we, we are creatures that have evolved on a certain planets with a certain environment and it's given us certain predispositions which we have to have in order to survive and pass on our DNA. Out there, those civilizations, as I say, with whom we would share nothing but prebiotic chemistry, who knows what evolutionary pathways would have taken them down. So I, I think you, you're right that we can't or shouldn't um, assume things about extraterrestrial civilizations, except, except that I think they have to obey the laws of physics as we currently understand them. They may have a much more uh, evolved understanding of physics, but I think it's important when we're discussing th these things to stick to what we know. Otherwise, it, it's, it's a little bit like playing tennis with the net down. There's, there's no rules. You can imagine anything. So I, I think we have to restrict ourselves to assuming that alien beings, if they exist, obey the laws of physics as we understand them. Probably they have to obey uh, laws of economics. But other than that, I think I think you're right. We, we, we have to try and be as non-parochial as we can possibly be. And it's difficult. Is that a solution to the Fermi paradox, though, that alien civilizations are simply not as broad as we are and that they just never get to the level of detectability simply because they're not equipped to? So they may be bound in oceans as aquatic life or something something stops them from getting to our level and and that it's simply that the solution is that we got lucky being bipedal mammals well of, of course i mean if you think of what it is that 
we're we're talking about in terms of making our presence felt across the universe, disturbing the universe in a way that another being can um, detect. So we're, we're talking about, first of all, being terrestrial creatures, because you're quite right. You can imagine um, aquatic um, creatures, super intelligent. They're not going to um, make their presence known. Dolphins, um, I, I, I don't know how intelligent they are. Octopuses seem to be um, very intelligent. However intelligent they are, they are not going to make their presence felt across the universe. So it's a terrestrial uh, civilization. You, you, you need that civilization to take, or, or, you, or you need that intelligence to happen on a, a planet where there is raw materials for the development of, of technology. Okay, if, if, if you don't have access to energy dense material, it's difficult to see what it is that you can do in terms of developing a civilization. The, 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 the act of um, reaching out across interstellar space presumably is not an act that can happen um, with an individual um, member, an, an individual creature. We're, we're talking about social creatures, presumably, because this would have to be an, an act of a group, a, a civilization, um, reaching out across space. So that implies social groupings. It implies communication skills, you know, sophisticated grammar in order to agree among the groupings that this is something that we're going to devote time and effort and resource towards doing. And it, it requires that level of intelligence. I mean, why... We, we think we are atop some level of um, evolutionary ladder. We're, we're, we're really not. I mean, we, we're just one tiny twig on this branch of evolution. But we do have a highly developed level of, of intelligence. Why do we have that? I mean, what evolutionary benefit does the ability to do integral calculus afford us? Now it gives us access to, to technology, but how did that evolve? Is it just some sort of um, accidental byproduct? So I, I would argue that we are actually incredibly special, but so is every other creature that has evolved on this planet for the past billion years. It's just that our particular constellation of uh, qualities, that idea of social grouping and complex grammar and high level of intelligence, that, that set of, uh, of qualities that define us, they happen to be the set of qualities that enable us, perhaps if we survive, to make our presence felt across the universe. And it's those sorts of qualities that presumably some alien creatures would have to have if they were going to reach out across the universe. Of course, a depressing thought is that maybe all of this constellation of, uh, of qualities, intelligence plus opposable thumbs, maybe that's a bad long-term evolutionary strategy. You know, maybe intelligence plus opposable thumbs equals disaster. I mean, that's another depressing resolution of the Fermi paradox. Yes, and that civilizations, once they arise, they quickly burn out, and we sort of look like that a little bit at this point. Now, could it be uh, as far as odds of, of, you know, celestial bodies producing alien life. Could it be, based on our solar system, where we have a whole bunch of candidates for ice shell moons, oceans underneath ice, could it be that the universe is largely aquatic and that the best we can ever hope for as far as an alien contact signal to us is a plea for help and an ask for uplifting because they're stuck in an ocean and we aren't. Is, <laughs> <laughs> does that have legs? <laughs> I, 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 I don't think they would be able to, to make that connection. I, I don't think they, they would know of the um, external world necessarily. It, it would be fascinating if, if we could communicate with an octopus or a, a dolphin and, and, and try and understand what it is that they perceive of the world and what they understand of the world. But I suspect that they would have 
zero understanding of of the cosmos and zero ability to um to make their their presence felt what you you, you mentioned about um ice worlds in and and, and oceans in the solar system in particular i, I think that's fascinating on, on a, a a very short time scale we might be able to find out whether abiogenesis is actually not as rare as i suggested it might have been maybe maybe we get to mars and we analyze samples and we discover that mars was once home to life that arose independently of life on earth or we go to enceladus or some of the other moons and discover that life began there that would be an absolutely amazing discovery if we find that it then suggests that abiogenesis isn't that incredibly rare thing that tatari said it might be but it's actually very common if we find that though if we do discover that it it, it really suggests that the answer to the fermi paradox is not necessarily something that's beneficial for us it perhaps means that the reason we don't see advanced civilizations even though they really should be because there's all this life out there it's because for whatever reason either a hostile universe or the fact that intelligent species inevitably uh, bring about their own destruction i think it brings that m- much more to the fore as a, a as a potential solution so part of me hopes that we don't find life on mars or enceladus or these other worlds that gets into questions of panspermia and our own origins we we could actually be aliens to this world if life arose on mars and was deposited here very early after the late heavy bombardment or during it but my question to you is this okay so we have all these missions and we're thinking of even more in the future to go and investigate the possibility of a biogenesis in ice shell moons and on mars and venus for that matter if we find that and we actually find a second genesis of life within our own solar system does that for you solve the fermi paradox and you can safely say they must be everywhere uh in various forms maybe not as as uh complex as we are but maybe we're rare but life itself is not does that solve the fermi paradox for you no it 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 actually makes it um a lot stronger what that discovery i think if it happens what that discovery would allow us to conclude is that life itself the creation of life itself is a, a a common occurrence because we would have multiple examples in one solar system we can i think safely assume that other solar systems other exoplanetary systems would then adopting that copernican principle would then have lots of at least low grade life it would it would begin to address the question about the role that biology plays in the universe and it would enable us perhaps then to go out and start thinking about the characterization of exoplanetary atmospheres uh, and, and and look for um the presence perhaps of low grade life affecting um exoplanetary at- atmospheres but if life if if the universe really is teeming with low grade life why then um seemingly has that evolutionary process towards um extraterrestrial civilizations not seemingly taken place so i think it would actually strengthen the paradox and i've changed my thinking considerably over the past few years around this i used to think that maybe the universe was full of yeah you know, some sort of pond scum and and, and low grade life and and, and I, i i still think it's possible but the the only way out of uh, of 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 the fermi paradox that i can see in that case other than that, that, that there's a, a barrier ahead of us that that somehow intelligence dies out is that the the jump from 
if you like, single-celled creatures to multicellular organisms, perhaps that's the jump that's difficult. And, and, and I think that's what we would have to hope is the case, that getting from simple unicellular life to multi complex multicellular life, maybe that's the difficult jump, and maybe that's what makes us special here on Earth. That took Earth like uh, something on, on the order of 1.8 billion years to do that, right? So that's a strong, great filter. Presumably, presumably. And it, it's difficult to know what happened, given uh, that it happened a long time ago, but presumably one cell ingested another for food and for whatever reason, um, those two cells coexisted, or maybe one cell infected another, and rather than the infection killing the first cell again, some sort of symbiotic relationship took place. It's difficult to know what happened, but maybe that is something that is unlikely to happen. And certainly on, on Earth, that long stretch of time that you mentioned perhaps indicates that it is uh, a, a, a barrier to jump. Yeah. That is actually a really fascinating thought that the development of symbiosis between organisms, which we see, you know, we see on this planet. Um, there are examples, for example, beans, where they, they carry a beneficial nitrogen fixing bacteria with them in their seeds and infect the soil with it so that they can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. And that's an interesting idea because it simply says that the solution of the Fermi paradox is that everything is microbial until <laughs> it chemically reaches a point where it can actually be exist symbiotically with another organism. But that also seems to open up a, a rather scary door because when you have symbiosis like that, doesn't that increase the chances, increase the complexity and the possibility of extinction? It, 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 it absolutely does. And it, it, it's another example where really to, to understand ourselves and our history, I, I think astrobiology can play potentially a really important role. And I, I, I don't think we're going to find the answers to these questions in the next two, three, four, five years. But I, I really am hopeful that with things like the Extremely Large Telescope coming, possibly even Webb, certainly with the successes to Webb, that we might be able to start reaching out, studying exoplanets, and maybe getting a handle on these sorts of questions. I, 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 I realize that so far I've been saying that, well, my preferred solution is that we're alone. Uh, and, and we've looked at solutions that suggest that we might be alone, or at least that we are the, the only intelligent species. I have to say, you know, a, a lot of people would, would argue that actually there is no Fermi paradox because they are here. You mentioned panspermia. One possibility is directed panspermia, so that the origin of life here on Earth came about because we were deliberately seeded by some other alien beings. And that idea that aliens are here or were here, I mean, that stretches right the way through to UAP, the modern UAP phenomena, uh, zoo hypothesis, planetarium hypothesis. So just for the, the, the sake of completeness, I, I, yeah, I have to say that actually possibly the most popular resolution of, of the Fermi paradox is that actually there isn't one, they're here. Now, we, of course, live in a world where a great many people believe they're here and people see things. And I, for one, don't doubt that people see things that they can't explain. I, I absolutely believe that people see UFOs. The question is, what is their origin and what are they? Do you think, based on the evidence that we have, and we have these things like congressional hearings in the US here and things like that, that are looking into the long history of ufology, do you think that that has legs? As a scientist, can you look at, at what we know based on that and say, this is worth looking into, or no, nothing here. 
So I would say no, there's nothing there. If you are arguing that these are alien craft, okay, there's clearly something there. Um, but I, I think it's important not to prejudge any of this. And, and, and this is where I have some issues with what's happening at present. So, so clearly there are UFOs, clearly there are, to use the more modern terminology, UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena. That's just, it's a given, it's clear. We, we, you know, there, there are records of them. What are they? Well, if we're going to um, investigate that question scientifically, that's fine. And I'd argue, actually, that we have to for safety reasons, because, you know, if, if, if these things are happening around military jets, there's the possibility of dreadful things happening. If it's happening around just commercial air flights, accidents might happen. So absolutely, they need to be uh, investigated. But why on earth would you go to astronomers as the first point of call for investigating these? It's almost as if you're saying that I know what these UAPs are. I've identified them. They're craft. They're alien craft. No, we, we, we don't know that. I, I think the people that need to be involved first in this um, identification and in, in this research about trying to identify them are uh, software engineers, uh, optical physicists, psychologists, aeronautical engineers. But there's a dozen specialities that I think should be brought to bear before you even think about bringing astronomers into the discussion because frankly the skill set of astronomers is not something that's particularly going to help i wouldn't have thought with this with this particular problem well that's always been the question because everybody always looks to the astronomers because public perception they're they're the ones who look at the skies but the thing is is that they typically only look at a very tiny part of the sky and would miss the ufo if it flew by and it's just not their bag. But what I wonder is if the best specialized scientists would be the atmospheric scientists, because absolutely there's some weird stuff that happens in the atmosphere of this planet as far as plasmas and things like that go that an astronomer wouldn't really. That's that's not what they do. So we should be asking the atmospheric scientists, right? Uh, absolutely. That would be personally my, my first port of call. If I can just, you've you just popped something into my head, which illustrates, I, I think, something potentially about the Fermi paradox, but also about the, the skill sets of, of different scientists. There was a gamma ray burst detected um, a, a few weeks ago. I, I, I can even remember what the the name of it is because I, I know the dates when it was uh, found. It's GRB 221009A. And this is the brightest gamma ray burst ever detected. Now, this is a, a, a Fermi paradox solution because if you're anywhere near a, a gamma ray burst, you're toast. What, what, what's fascinating about this one is that it, it's about 2 billion light years away. I mean, quite a distance. And yet atmospheric scientists, and this is what you, you said that just popped into my mind, atmospheric scientists detected it. It affected the way that radio waves propagated in Earth's atmosphere from a distance of 2 billion light years. I find it absolutely incredible that the universe can impact on Earth from that distance, but it can. And it was atmospheric scientists that, that noticed that that impact. I don't think astronomers particularly would have would, would have thought about that. They were interested in it was Fermi space satellite that detected it and various other uh, gamma ray and X-ray uh, telescopes. Incredibly bright event, incredibly violent event, and, and uh, actually a nice example of, of astronomers and atmospheric scientists working in tandem, but they were looking at very different things. But 
it's still the universe. <laughs> so anything that you observe is an aspect of the universe. So they kind of mesh together. Do you think that interdisciplinary science is a disadvantage? In other words, do you think people are too specialized and don't come together enough for a complete understanding of the universe? Do you think that crossing the aisle between sciences we need more of that. Oh, absolutely. And, and this is one of the fascinating aspects of this uh, question for me, um, the, the, the Fermi question. I, I find it fascinating because physicists have a, a take on it. Well, of course we do because we're arrogant and we have a take on everything. But um, astronomers have something to say about it. Biologists have something to say about it. I've seen lots of interesting papers from historians and sociologists. This is a, a, a question that can bring so many people together with so many different insights. And we can learn from each other. And, and, and that's one of the beauties, I think, of, of an interdisciplinary question like this. The problem we have is institutionally, it can be difficult to, to bring these people together. That, that there are relatively few mechanisms for doing that. And it is still the case that in, in, in terms of academic career advancement, you're better off picking a subsliver of nothing and becoming the world's expert in that than you are taking a broader view. I, I, I think that's a shame. It is a shame. I mean, it's almost a compartmentalization of the understanding of the universe and that, I mean, we even need perhaps to talk to archaeologists and the idea of maybe maybe if we Absolutely. start looking in the solar system at interstellar objects passing through, maybe astroarchaeology might become a science or something like astropaleontology, things that that we just don't really think of right now because of a, a, a lack of open mind, perhaps, in that in anything we do, when looking into the cosmos, we might simply be thwarted by our own biases and we're missing it. Do you think that we're simply missing it? Is that the solution of the Fermi paradox? We have to be so, so aware of bias. And, 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 and let me give you one example of a bias that I, I think can negatively impact on our thinking in, in this area. And I, I'd call it um, a, a, a recency bias or a, a modernity bias. I'm not sure what the word would be, but if you look through history, the solutions that people come up with to the problem of extraterrestrial life are cast in terms of the technology that's available to them right then and there, almost inevitably, perhaps. So we have you know, really great thinkers like uh, Gauss. I mean, one of the great mathematical minds of all time. He was thinking about the possibility of communicating across interplanetary distances by digging trenches in uh, the desert, pouring kerosene in and setting fire to it in the shape, a, a trench of the shape of a, an equilateral triangle or something like that, or, or, or planting forests in the shape of an equilateral triangle, something that could be visible from Mars. Great thinker like that, inevitably constrained by the, the technology that was available to him of the day. A little bit later, um, Victorian times, the Victorians have this great public health initiative of canalization. You get dirty water away, you get clean water to a city. It vastly improved public health and led to increased lifespan. It's a great invention. Soon after that, people started seeing canals on Mars. Canals, incidentally, that aren't there. We, in the, the 1950s, started thinking about, well, how can we send signals across interstellar space and, and Kokoni and Morrison were looking at electromagnetism and we were understanding radio at that that time. We had radio sets and and they came up with, with radio as, as the means of doing it. Around about the same time, lasers were invented, but there were puny things back then. Now we understand how much 
power you can pump into a laser. And now we're thinking, well, optical SETI is probably possibly a good bet. You know, we can outshine a star at certain wavelengths by pumping in energy at particular wavelengths into a laser. So, so if you look back at the thinking around this, it's, it's always constrained by the technology that's available to us at, at a particular time. And almost, how could it be any different? You know, that, that's what shapes our thinking. I, I don't know how we move away from uh, those shackles. You know, may, maybe science fiction can help us. Maybe there are other creative ways of doing it. But that's an example of, of just one bias, I think, that's a, a cognitive bias that's very, very difficult for us to, to move away from. But when we're talking about creatures, and I go back to this, with whom we share nothing in common apart from chemistry and a, a shared physical universe, we have to be open, I think, to, to, to many different possibilities. And it's difficult. It's difficult to, to take that interdisciplinary approach. It's difficult to take that um, approach where we free ourselves of all of these uh, mental biases. So, so maybe the solution is we're just not clever enough yet um, to understand the, the solution to the Fermi paradox. I, I, I have to uh, I have to toss something out there that, that amuses me. The idea that if we ever came into contact with an alien civilization and they tell us that the reason that they haven't communicated with us is that they were expecting us to plant a bunch of trees in a triangle and that would have been it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> All right, doctor, we have to take a break and we will be back in a moment. Now, Doctor, as someone that has studied the Fermi Paradox um, extensively, out of all of the solutions to the Fermi Paradox, which one keeps you up at night? Which one disturbs you the most? It's the thought that we are alone. And I can tell you why. It's when you go out on a cloudless night and you look up at the sky and depending on, on where you are and how much light pollution there is, you can see a few tens of stars, if you're lucky, thousands of stars. I've, I've seen the Milky Way, and it's a gorgeous sight. The universe is vast, and I do find it psychologically unsettling to think that it's just us, that we are the only intelligent, sapient species in the universe. That's the solution that I think is correct. I think it's the solution that certainly addresses observation or the lack of observation of, of extraterrestrials. But it is one that I find profoundly disturbing, profoundly disappointing as well, because I was brought up in a science fictional universe and i would love us to be able to communicate with with other beings find out what their thoughts are about religion about science about music all of these things these questions that it would be fascinating to ask them might just be impossible because it's just us the other weighty aspect to that solution is that it puts, I think, a huge uh, pressure on humankind not to screw things up. And I'm talking from an island that has recently had a competition between the Prime Minister and a lettuce, a salad, and a salad one. So I'm very occasionally when things like that happen i'm very depressed about the the thought of whether we will actually survive and whether potentially the only part of the universe that can observe itself which is here it might die out and that would be a, an absolute cosmic tragedy so that keeps me up at, at times now could you say and this has been advanced in in 
theoretical physics before collapsing wave functions. If we weren't here, would the universe ultimately even exist? And if it did, what would it matter? That is an absolutely fascinating question. I have to say that yes, I think it would exist. But would it matter? No, I, I think these are fascinating philosophical questions, John. And you really need to get a philosopher on to answer those things. A, a, a physicist, a scientist is probably lacking the, the, the mental acuity, I think, to answer those sorts of questions. A philosopher, I know that physicists often decry the, the input of philosophers, but these are the sorts of questions where actually philosophical thought comes into its own. And I, I have had discussions with um, philosophers in Italy about the ethical and the moral dimension to the Fermi paradox. If it really is just us, what are the, the ethical and the moral, moral dimensions? But that question that you asked, what would it matter if we weren't here and the universe were empty. Ask a philosopher. I would be fascinated to know what they think of that. I will do so at some point. I think my biggest question there is that if we are alone and we never see anything, which I mean, that's something we could never prove. No, nope. we, we could never prove we are alone. But no, nope, that's one could say that if we think we are alone, philosophy becomes that much more important <laughs> because all of a sudden the Copernican principle is defeated and we apparently occupy the most important point in the universe. Well, well shouldn't we act as if we were alone until we know we're not? I'm, I'm asking that. Uh, I'm, I'm just putting the question back to you. Sh should we not? Well, I like the Copernican principle, and here's my biases. I like repeatability. I like that the universe always uh, produces other examples and that things are simply a, a, a member of a population of like objects, like occurrences. My natural inclination is to say that we're not alone and that we're just one civilization out of many that exist through time and space, and that Ultimately, if if things like the, the geometry of the universe and, you know, it appears to be flat, so maybe it's infinite, in which case we can't be alone because you're up against infinity. There has to be other examples. So I, I tend to live in that zone where I just assume that we're not special and that we're just one occurrence of many. Now, we might be rare. You know, we might be very rare and intelligence doesn't happen that often. But I agree with you in the sense that us being alone is the most disturbing solution to the Fermi paradox because it we we suddenly look very unlikely and very unnatural and that does bother me now there are contenders the zoo hypothesis is a pretty spooky one yes yes or a group of spooky solutions but that we are alone does at it at its very deepest terrify me the, the, the zoo hypothesis and the planetarium hypothesis, I, I find spooky, absolutely. Th that notion that the universe is infinite and therefore there must be other life out there. I, I, I take issue with it slightly in that the observable universe, which is what we're talking about, that has a definite horizon. Uh, be, beyond that, uh, uh, absolutely, who, who knows? But I, I would say until we have the evidence to the contrary, I think it is safer to assume that we are because that we are alone. Because one of the, the worries that I would have is that if we assume that we're not, there's the possibility that at least some people will think that salvation is going to come from outside of us, that things won't screw up because these benevolent beings will 
save us, that they're out there, they wouldn't let bad things happen to us. I think that's a dangerous assumption. I think it's a safer assumption to say, as far as we know, we're alone, and that whether we survive or not is down to our actions. And there's an imperative on us to get our act together. And if we want to disturb the universe in a way that we hope other civilizations might, and we might one day pick up, if, if we want to be in that position, we have to survive long enough in order to do that. And that's going to take work. And it, it, it it's, it's hard work that we have to engage in. We can't outsource that hard work to some potentially mythical alien beings. Could it be a unifying factor, though, say that we discovered a radio signal, something like that, the wow signal repeats or something that's unambiguous, which is really, really hard and steady, but an unambiguous signature of an alien civilization out there somewhere. Could that galvanize the human species to say, look, they survived and have built a high technology civilization. So can we. So maybe we need to look at our problems a little bit more carefully and work towards solving them and think a little bit further than a year ahead. And we can achieve that. Do you think that the discovery of alien life through whatever means might be a unifying galvanizing factor for humanity and a watershed? to get us to act responsibly for a change? I guess it would depend on the nature of the signal. If it's a signal similar to what Arthur Clarke described in, in The Star, which was the dying, we are here beacon of a, of a civilization that's, who, whose star is going to destroy them in a supernova, that would be unbearably poignant. That would be one sort of communication. I'd like to think that what you just described would happen, that it would be a watershed moment in history. The, the cynic in me, uh, and I am sounding awfully cynical, but it's partly to do with the news cycle in this country in particular over the past few weeks. The cynic in me would say, I wonder whether it would be a seven day wonder that would almost immediately be forgotten. And, and the reason I say that is that the distances involved, assuming that we're, we're living in a universe that has that speed of light speed limit, you know, we won't even be able to share a knock knock joke with that civilization. But we would at least, you, you're quite right, have the, the knowledge then that we were not alone. I suspect that the, the impact would be that of a seven day wonder and then it would die away. But I think it would have a profound long-term effect on humans. I, I, I think it would have uh, an impact on philosophy, it would have an impact on religion, it would have an impact on ultimately how we view ourselves. But it would, I think, take a long time for that to percolate through our society. It's a fascinating question. And it's a great what if. Well, you have to, you have to, uh, you have to digest what you learn. And that doesn't happen overnight. And I, I wonder with to end on this, I wonder, about certain things that there was once an atmospheric scientist that looked into the UAP phenomena, Dr. James E. McDonald, and his conclusions after many years of studying it was that the, the alien hypothesis was the least worst one. Do you think that there could be things in the universe that are even stranger than alien life? If, if we found um, alien life, it, it, it wouldn't necessarily surprise me. Okay, I've, I've spent a lot of this interview saying that I, I think we're alone, and I, and I think we are. But if we found evidence of alien life, it wouldn't necessarily surprise me because of the first leg of, of, of the Fermi paradox, which is this idea that actually, if there's nothing special about us, and, and we're talking about 
normal physical, chemical, biological processes, you would expect expect to see them. So in, in that sense, I, I, I don't think the discovery of life would be strange. It would be phenomenal, but not necessarily strange. I think the uh, manifestation of that life would seem strange to us because of who knows what evolutionary pathways would would have wh where it would have taken them. So it would appear strange, but the discovery itself isn't strange. I is there anything stranger than than alien life? I am very much a a, a materialist. I I don't um, share some of the, the the views that perhaps fringe uh, communities do but i find actually within physics um, a huge amount of strangeness you mentioned quantum physics that's strange it, it, it's something i've spent you know my, my career in in part studying I, I i understand the mathematics of it but when i try and get my head around actually what it means do we have a you know, the, the many worlds interpretation of of quantum mechanics is one that increasingly I'm coming round to accepting, but that's that's strange. So I, I think even within the the, the physical universe, there's, there's plenty enough strangeness to to go around. <laughs> that's a disturbing thought. If the many worlds interpretation is correct, we may be in the one timeline that doesn't have alien life. And that all the others do. <laughs> now, Doctor, that, that's, that's what... <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be that would be the ultimate and disappointing for me is that I'm in the reality that doesn't have it. Damn. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> now, tell us about your books. What are you working on? So I have a book out in December. It's called Around the World in 80 Ways. So it's a, um, a collection of 80 choropleths, which are colored maps, colored world maps. And I've used world maps to illustrate various data sets, things of interest, questions of interest to me, like life expectancy in different countries, the proportion of energy that comes from renewables in different countries and nuclear power in different countries and and so on. So, that's, so that was a, a bit of a lockdown project for me. I've just finished the first draft of a book whose title I'm not quite sure about, but it'll be something like a, a pub quiz guide to the universe. So I have 500 strange uh, questions that... Um, I find quite quite interesting, uh, and the idea is that the solutions to those questions, which I will provide, give a give a history of, of astronomy and a, a and our understanding of the universe. So that, that, that's what I've been working on recently. Now that sounds absolutely interesting. Everybody can check out Doctor Webb's books on at your favorite online book retailer or otherwise. And Doctor, thanks for joining us again today. And I look forward to perhaps another discussion someday about the many and growing solutions to the Fermi paradox. I hope so, John. It's been fascinating as always with you. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice. Anna, it's Halloween. Where's my pirate hat? John, isn't it time for a new hat? You've gone as a pirate every Halloween since 1977. And the hat is getting a bit faded. No, that's unthinkable. I've been through everything with that hat. I started my YouTube channel wearing it. Now where is it? Look in the corner, John. Wait a minute. The possum is wearing my hat. And he's resized it. It won't fit now. He simply washed it, John. Something you never did. I'm afraid to say it did shrink a little. But he's done a trade. Look in the driveway. There's a car out there. Is the LeBaron back? No. It's even better. An El Camino. I can drive in style again.
Wait a minute. Doesn't have an engine. Hold on. Why is there a horse grazing in the backyard? Wait a minute. The possum expects me to drive the car being pulled by a horse. You always said you wanted more horsepower, John. I, you know, I just want my hat back. And the possum cackles. Anyway, happy Halloween, everyone.